as I said, the first service, but it is a hard ask to follow. <laughs> when I hang out with Unitarian Universalist Christians, sometimes, not always, but sometimes, I hear them talk about feeling a little bit marginalized and misunderstood as a minority in this faith. And when I hang out with Unitarian Universalist humanists, sometimes, not always, but sometimes, I hear them talk about feeling like a marginalized group within this faith. In fact, a man named Michael Werner, who is somewhat of an influential uh, person in UU humanist circles, published a book a couple of years ago called Regaining Balance, in which he writes that Unitarian Universalism has become an unwelcoming faith for humanists and agnostics and atheists. And when I hang out with Unitarian Universalist pagans, sometimes, not always, but sometimes, I hear them talk about feeling underserved, underappreciated, and marginalized. When I hang out with Unitarian Universalist Buddhists, actually, I don't hear them complain. <laughs> But I do hear Unitarian Universalist Buddhists tell jokes, though they are kind and compassionate jokes, <laughs> about how bad other UUs are at sitting in silence for more than 30 seconds. <laughs> and when I hang out with lifelong Unitarian Universalists, sometimes, not always, but sometimes, I hear them complain about feeling like a marginalized minority, outnumbered as they are by all those hyphenated Unitarian Universalists, the UU hyphen humanists, and UU hyphen Christians, and UU hyphen pagans, and UU hyphen Buddhists. Where is the space they wonder for them, the unhyphenated ones? And after the service, the first service this morning, Three different people came up to me and told me that I omitted the Jewish Unitarian Universalists <laughs> and that that made them feel marginalized. <laughs> you could choose a couple ways to see this. You could choose to see this as harsh and damning criticism, or, and, or, you could see it as a sign, a sign that in some ways there may be something right somehow. After all, if any of us come to a congregation expecting only to be made comfortable, only to have our views agreed with, only to have our preferences catered to and our biases confirmed, only to have our concerns centered, we may not be able to grow. We know this, right, at some level. We know that if we surround ourselves with sycophants, and if we fire the advisors who give us the advice we don't want to hear, if we listen only to the opinions we agree with, if we disbelieve the science that we find inconvenient, it's going to end in disaster. My sermon this morning has to do with theological pluralism within this UU faith, and with both the blessings and the challenges that that pluralism poses. In my sermon this morning, I'm going to do a couple of different things. The first thing I'm going to do is talk about the historical origins of Unitarianism and Universalism, grounding our faith in its origins as two separate Christian denominations. So the first part's going to be the history. And then I'm going to bring us up to the present and speak about our theological pluralism telling two or three stories that I find really wonderful and hopeful. And then finally, I want to offer my own vision about our theological trajectory as a religious tradition. But first, the history. Historically speaking, both Universalism and Unitarianism emerged in the United States in the late 18th and early 19th century out of conflicts and tensions that were coming to a boil in the Congregationalist branch of Christianity. 
Similar conflicts and tensions had led to similar results a handful of decades earlier in England among the religious groups that had been born there out of the Radical Reformation. Both Unitarian and Universalist thought, though, originated within Christianity. The arguments for Unitarianism and Universalism, about Unitarianism and Universalism, those arguments as they appeared in sermons and lectures and books and pamphlets were steeped in biblical interpretation. So when, for example, when Hosea Ballou advanced his argument about universal salvation, he made the argument from what is written in the Bible. Here are the words of Jesus, he said, and here are the words of Paul, and here is what I read in the Bible, and these words in the Bible tell me that we are all saved. Both Unitarianism and Universalism started out as denominations that self-identified as Christian and as people trying to take the Christian tradition as seriously as they possibly could, even if that meant following their conscience and coming to a conclusion about it that broke with orthodoxy. And so when did it change? When did some Universalists and Unitarians begin to identify other than Christian? Well, the answer to that is that it's complicated. It depends. But it may be later than you think. Two things seem to happen around the same time or in quick succession. During the mid and late 19th century, many leading Unitarian and Universalist thinkers began to stretch and expand and push against the definition of what is Christian. And then beginning in the late 19th and early 20th century, some Unitarian and Universalist thinkers began to imagine an identity that was not entirely or necessarily Christian. Back when I was in high school, I read one of the most famous sermons ever delivered in the history of Unitarianism. In 1841, a brash young minister named Theodore Parker preached a sermon in Boston called The Transient and Permanent in Christianity. He attempted to ask, and this, this sermon, by the way, was so controversial that it got him all the other ministers broke fellowship with him, refused to engage with him after this. Um, Theodore Parker, by the way, he spoke um, to a congregation which numbered about 2,500 people on a Sunday morning. Too big for any of the church buildings in Boston, so they met in the biggest theater in town. So um, as, you, as you hear what he's about to say, or hear what I say about what he's about to say or what he said, Keep that in mind. So in this sermon, The Transient and the Permanent Christianity, he attempted to ask what is eternally central to the Christian faith and what's transient, what is inessential. And he reached some extremely radical conclusions. He concluded, he argued, that the Bible is not essential to Christianity. And he concluded that Jesus is not essential to Christianity. Which, that had a profound impact on me reading that as a 17 year old. <laughs> So, so what I'm saying is that Theodore Parker broke us away from Christianity in 1841. Well, no. For one thing, Theodore Parker called himself a Christian and thought of himself as a Christian and thought of his life as really following the, the, the faith that Jesus taught. Uh, Theodore Parker was an, was an activist. He did things like... Um, escaped slaves from Virginia came and he hid them in his home. And uh, when the U.S. Marshals came looking for them, he kind of pointed them in a different direction and uh, misled them and, and um, gave these uh, escaped slaves from Virginia safe passage to Canada. So he's this, this activist. And earlier this summer, a friend of mine uh, sent me the, the greatest gift, a, a copy of Theodore Parker's Prayers, published in 1861. I'm so thankful for this. And reading these prayers, he said, I'm, I'm a little bit digressing here, but, but that's okay. Um, reading, reading these prayers, it's really cool because we know the dates, and so it's like, what did this, this guy who was just this activist, was, you know, hiding escaped slaves, what did he pray? in his congregation the following Sunday. Isn't that interesting to ask? 
and his prayers were all extremely Christian. They were full of God, full of Jesus, full of passages from the Bible. Every single one includes some version of the Lord's Prayer. Many of them include some version of the 23rd Psalm. And so it's this very interesting mix of this person who in 1841 had argued all these radical propositions, but then we find him in 1851 or 1855 just giving these very Jesus-filled and scripture-filled prayers. It's confusing. We find in our history that through the years, things don't move in one unified flow, but rather that things are complex. Some you use in the history that followed adopted an identity as free religionists, strictly renouncing all labels. Some imagined a religion of one common humanity. Some imagined a syncretistic religion, combining all the world's religious, religious traditions into one super-religion. Some imagined a return to pre-religion, a resurrection of ancient folk and indigenous practices. Some continue to this day to understand our faith as a part of Christianity and as an expression of the Christian tradition. Things aren't simple and defy easy categorization. And I have to tell you, I love things that aren't simple. And I love things that defy easy categorization. And I want to tell you a couple stories about wonderful complexity. Wonderful complexity that I find sweet and hopeful. My last year in Divinity School, I was also the halftime minister of um, uh, under John Burens, who was at that point past president of the Unitarian Universalist Association. He was just beginning his ministry in Needham, Massachusetts. And at his installation service, one of the speakers was the minister of the very large and very prominent United Church of Christ Church just down the street. And she gets up in the pulpit uh, to speak at this installation, and she says to the congregation in Needham, just because you are the only Unitarian church in town does not mean that you are the biggest Unitarian church in town. I have more parishioners who don't believe in the Trinity than you do. <laughs> and I found that wonderful complexity really, really sweet in that it broke down these categories that we might form in our minds. As if by miracle, as if the universe knew my topic for this morning, I found a story in the New York Times on Friday. It wasn't the story I went looking for in the New York Times, but it was the story I found, amen? The story that I found carried this headline. It's a long headline. What draws Atheists, Jews, and Catholics to a Presbyterian church. At Rutgers Presbyterian Church in Manhattan, social justice and environmental issues unite the congregation, and there's Bible stuff, too. <laughs> I love that headline. The article, the article goes on to describe how in a city, a city with a lot of dying, shrinking, declining, empty churches, this particular Presbyterian church is flourishing and attracting passionate and committed congregants who aren't Presbyterians, aren't Christians, aren't even people who believe in God. There's a passage from that article in which the reporter writes, typically the connective tissue of any congregation is an embrace of a shared faith, yet at Rutgers Presbyterian on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, it has rejected that. Sharing a belief in God, any God at all, isn't necessary. Instead, the community there has been cobbled together by a different code of convictions, pulled in by social justice efforts, activism against climate change, meal programs for the homeless, and a task force to help refugee families. The article credits two factors in the success of this church. The first factor is the church's prophetic justice work. It speaks out and acts out in regards to the moral issues of our time and seeks to take of people who are hurting. And then secondly, 
the factor that the article says is an influence and a success is that the people there take care of each other. The article ends by quoting a, a parishioner who talks about how she began attending not because she was interested in Presbyterianism, but because she gets around with a walker and this was the house of worship that was least hard for her to attend. And she says about her time there, I have come to care about a lot of the people, and I know that they care a lot about me. Amen. Right? And this seems to me like I could imagine this is the type of church that Jesus would want to be in. Not people all in the same category, but a place where we actually take care of one another and care about the forces that are hurting people. As I read this article in the New York Times, I had to smile because this church actually sounded a lot like this church when it first started. Born out of Presbyterianism, held together by a connective tissue of a passionate stance on a moral issue, in the case of this church, the civil rights movement and ending segregation in Chapel Hill, our membership likewise from the early days included not just Presbyterians. And if you look at our membership book, you know there were atheists and Jews and Catholics in there as well. These communities connected not by creed, but by a common ethic of love, a sense of compassion, and a powerful motivation to make the world a better place. That beautiful complexity. The reading this morning that Nathan delivered was a poem by Anne Sexton, and it's the image that I want to turn to now. The poem comes from her book, The Awful Rowing Towards God, and the final poem in that collection begins with this image of rowing. The poet describes blisters that form and break and heal and form and break and heal, chapped lips, crusted salt, sweat and exhaustion. You can picture being out on that ocean, that harsh ocean. And then at last, the poet arrives at the island of God. And what does she find but that God comes out and deals her into a game of poker? And just as she thinks she wins the game with her royal straight flush, God changes the game, revealing five aces. A wild card. It ends with laughter, that untamable, eternal, gut-driven ha-ha and lucky love. And what this... Poem. The reason I chose the poem this morning is the way that it just breaks chains and breaks categories. Because I think when we, when we try to narrow religion down, to reduce it down, to force it to fit into definitions and categories and follow ground rules, religion doesn't work then. Religion cannot be reduced to a creed or a category. Christianity can't be reduced to a logical formula, if not A, then B. A Christian will tell you that that's, it's not, a, it's not a, a logical, it's not, it's not just a, a simple statement of, of logic, but it rather is this lived reality breaks the rules and breaks the chains and makes sense and, and doesn't make sense and inspires us. You know that any faith can't be reduced to a creed or a category or a logical proposition. You know that Jesus broke the rules and God does not play poker by the rules and that faith resists categorization, breaks every chain. I want to end with a different poem, a part of a different poem, and a different story for you. It's one of those hopeful stories. Because I do think, I do think that in the future of theology, it will not be in people who 
fit nicely within categories, but within these beautiful blurrings of the categories with hyphenated Buddhists and hyphenated pagans and Christian humanists and all of these wonderful categories. The story I want to tell you takes place in Waco, Texas. I once went and visited the UU Fellowship in Waco, Texas, membership about 50. I went there because they had gotten a new minister, a new part-time minister, and they were doing a service of installation. Now, Waco, Texas, the big university in town is Baylor University, which is a, which is a Southern Baptist school. And employment at Baylor includes signing a statement of faith which if you break, you can lose your job. And so when people gather at the UU Fellowship in Waco, Texas, some of the members, not the members who, but the, but the members of that church who are professors and administrators at Baylor, they don't park in the parking lot. They park on side streets, and many of them walk through the woods to come to church for plausible deniability that they were there. And at this installation service, the prayer was given by a Baptist preacher. And he looked and said, to tell you the truth, you Unitarian Universalists, I do not understand you. But you are a dapper people. And glory be to, quoting the, the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins, and glory be to God for dapper things. For God is surely a lover of dapper things. And then he went on and said, and Jesus, Jesus was a lover dappled things. Jesus did not take only those who were one or the other, but those in between those who mixed. And God and Jesus is surely present in the midst of dappled things, for God is surely a lover of dappled things. The best prayer I've ever heard in the entire <laughs> It's that truth, right? And what is dappled? What is dappled? It's neither, neither purely shade nor purely sunlight, but that mixture of the two, as the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins says, for skies of couple color as a brinded cow, for rose moles all in stipple upon trout that swim, fresh fire coal, chestnut falls, finches' wings, landscape plotted and pieced, fold, fallow, and plow. And all things counter original, spare and strange, whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how. Praise him. Glory be to God for double things. Glory be to this double thing. And glory be to all of our efforts. All of our efforts to break the chains that we don't even know about. And to dismantle the categories that we put up that are false. Amen. Blessed be. And let us sing our closing hymn of the morning, number 131, Love Will Guide Us. And I want you to sing like you are so happy about the band that's playing this morning. I want you to sing your praise to them because it's good stuff.